Well, here we are. Monday, September 5th, 2022. It's Labor Day. And Larissa. And we're going to continue reading Mr. Salman Rushdie's Haroon and the Sea of Stories. We've got three chapters left. Three chapters left. That's it. And the story's done, and then I gotta pick another book to read. What will it be? You look at chapter nine. There in the description, there's the books that are the options for the next read. Chapter 10, Haroon's Wish. <clears throat> As Haroon and Ith stood there at the top of the stairs, the absolute darkness created by thousands of dark bulbs suddenly disappeared to be replaced by the dim twilight. Katum Shud had ordered the big switch off so that he could taunt his captives by showing them the extent of his power. Haroon and Ith could see their way now and began to walk down into the belly of that immense ship. All around them, Chipwallas were putting on really rather fashionable wraparound dark glasses to help them see better in the increased light, level of light. Now they look like office clerks pretending to be rock stars, thought Haroon. He could now see that below decks, the dark ship was a single uh, vol 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 voluminous cavern around which walkways ran at, at seven different levels, connected by stairways and ladders. And it was full of machinery and what machines they were Far too complicated to describe, if murmured. What a whirring of whirs and stirring of stirs. What ranks of lifters and banks of sifters. What a humming of squeezers and a thrumming of freezers was there. Katum Shud waited for them on a high catwalk, tossing butt the hoopo's brain idly from hand to hand. No sooner had Haroon and If, and their guards of course, reached him than he began dryly to explain everything. Haroon forced himself to listen, even though the cult master's voice was boring enough to send a person to sleep in ten seconds flat. These are the poison blenders, Katum Shud was saying. We must make, make a great many poisons, because each and every story in the ocean needs to be ruined in a different way. To ruin a happy story, you must make it sad. To ru ruin an action drama, you must make it move too slowly. To ruin a mystery, you must make the criminal's identity obvious, even to the most stupid audience. To ruin a love story, you must turn it into a tale of hate. To ruin a tragedy, you must make it capable of in inducing helpless laughter. To ruin an ocean of stories, muttered If, the water genie, you must add a katoom shoot. Say what you like, the cult master told him. Say it while you can. He went on with his terrifying explanations. Now, the fact is that I personally have discovered that for every story, there is an anti-story. I mean that every story, and so every stream of story, has a shadow self. And if you pour this anti-story into the story, the two cancel each other out, and bingo, end of story. Now then. You see here the proof that I have found a way of synthesizing these anti-stories, these shadow tales. Yes, I can mix them up right here in laboratory conditions and produce a most efficient concentrated poison that none of the stories in your precious ocean can resist. These concentrated poisons are what we have been releasing one by one into the ocean. You have, you've seen how sick the poison, how thick the poison is here, thick as treacle. That's because all the shadow tails are packed together so closely. Gradually, they will flow out along the currents of the ocean, each anti-story seeking out its victim. Each day, we synthesize and release new poisons. Each day, we murder new tails. Soon now, soon, the ocean will be dead, cold and dead. When black ice freezes over its surface, my victory will be complete. But why do you hate stories so much? Haroon blurted, feeling stunned. Stories are fun! The world, however, is not for fun, Katum Shud replied. The world is for controlling. Which world, Haroon made himself ask. Your world, my world, all worlds, came the reply. They are, they are all there to be ruled. And inside every single story, inside every stream in the ocean, there lies a world, a story world, that I cannot rule at all. And that is the reason why. Now the cult master pointed out, 
the refrigeration machines that kept the poisons, the anti-stories, at the necessary lo low temperatures. <clears throat> and he pointed out the filtration machines that removed all dirt and impurities from the poisons so that they were 100% pure, 100% deadly. And he explained why, as part of the manufacturing process, the poison had to spend some time in the cauldrons up on deck. Like all good wine, the anti-stories improve. They are permitted to breathe for a while in the open air before being released. After 11 minutes of this, Haroon stopped listening. He followed Katum Shud and If along the high catwalk until they reached another part of the ship in which Chikwalas were putting together large mysterious segments of what looked like hard black rubber. Now this, said the cult master, and something in his voice made Haroon pay attention, is where we are building the plug. What plug, cried If, as an appalling idea took shape in his thoughts. You can't mean... You will have seen the giant crane up on deck, said Katum Shud in the most monotonous voice. You will have noted the chains going down into the waters. At the other end of those chains, Chupwalla divers are rapidly assembling the largest and most efficient plug ever constructed. It is almost complete, little spies, almost complete, and so in a few days we shall be able to put it to good use. We are going to plug the wellspring itself, the source of stories, which lies directly beneath the ship on the ocean bed. As long as the source remains unplugged, fresh, unpoisoned, renewing story waters will pour upwards into the ocean and our work will only be half done. But when it's plugged, ah, then the ocean will lose all its power to resist my anti-stories and the end will come very soon. And then, water genie, what will there be for you guppies to do but accept the victory of Bezabon? Never, said If, but he didn't sound very convincing. How do the divers enter the poison waters without being hurt, Haroon asked. Katum Shud smiled, a dry little smile. Paying attention again, I see, he said. The obvious answer is that they wear protective clothing. Here, in this cover, are numbers of poison-proof suits. He led, he led them on past the plug assembly zone to an area occupied by the largest machine in the entire ship. And this, said Katum Shud, almost permitting a note of pride to enter his dull, flat voice, is our generator. What does that do, asked Haroon, who had never been of a particularly scientific turn of mind. It is the device for converting mechanical energy into electrical energy by means of electromagnetic induction, replied Katumshud, if you must know. Haroon was unabashed. Do you mean it's where your power supply comes from? He persevered. Precisely, the cult master replied. I see that education is not quite at a standstill on Earth. At this point, something wholly unexpected occurred. Through an open portal, a few paces from the cult master, bizarre rooty tendrils began to enter the dark ship. They came in at a high speed, a great un unformed mass of vegetation, among which was a single lilac-colored flower. Haroon's heart gave a great leap of joy. Mm, he, he began, but then he held his tongue. Molly had ex escaped capture, as Haroon later learned, by reassuming the appearance of a bunch of lifeless roots. He had floated slowly towards the dark ship and then used the suction pads on several of, of the tendrils which made up his body to climb out the ice outside of the vessel like a creeper. Now, as he completed his dramatic entry and whirled himself into a, in, whirled himself in a, thri, in, a, in, a, in a trice into his more familiar molly shape, the alarm was sounded. Intruder, intruder alert. Switch on the darkness, screeched Katum Shud his usual insipid manner falling away from him like a mask. Molly began to move at high speed in the direction of the generator. Before the dark bulbs had been switched on, he had reached the gigantic machine, having eluded numbers of Chupwalla guards whose eyesight wasn't what it should have been, owing to the dim twilight and in spite of their really rather fashionable wraparound dark sunglasses, dark glasses. Without pausing for an instant, the floating gardener leapt into the air, disassembling his body as he did so, and flung roots and tendrils all over the generator, getting into every nook and cranny of the machine. There now began a series of loud bangs and crashes as circuits blew and cogwheels broke and the mighty generator came to a, a juddering halt. The ship's entire power supply was cut off at once. Stirrers stopped stirring and whirrers stopped whirring. Blenders stopped blending and menders stopped mending. Squeezers stopped squeezing and freezers stopped freezing. Poison stores stopped storing and poison pours stopped their pouring. The entire operation was at a standstill. 
Hooray, Molly Haroon cheered. Nice work, mister. Too good. <clears throat> Chuck Walla guards now attacked Molly in large numbers, pulling it at, at him with their bare hands, hacking at him with axes and swords, but a creature tough enough to withstand the concentrated poisons which Katoom Shud had been pouring into the ocean of stories wasn't bothered by such flea bites. He hung onto the generator until he was sure it was ruined beyond hope of quick repair, and as he clung to the machine, he began in his rough gardener's way to sing through the lilac flower that served him for a mouth. You can chop a flower bush, you can chop a tree, you can chop liver, but you can't chop me. You can chop change, you can chop chop and karate, but you... You can chop suey, but you can't chop me. Oh my God, that's horrible. That's a horrible, horrible verse, Mr. Rushdie. Okay, Haroon told himself, seeing that Katoom Shu's attention was wholly focused on the floating gardener. Come on, Haroon, it's your turn. And it's now or never. It's now or never. The, the little emergency something. The bite light was still hidden under his tongue. Quickly, he put it between his teeth and bit. The light that poured out from his mouth was as bright as the sun. The Chuckwallas all around him were blinded, and they broke their vows of silence to shriek and utter curses as they clutched their eyes. Even Katoom Shud reeled back from the glare. Haroon moved as fast as he'd ever moved in his life. He took the bite of light out of his mouth and held it over his head. Now the light poured in every direction, illuminating the entire vast interior of the massive ship. Those eggheads back at P2C2E house certainly know a thing or two, Haroon thought in wonderment. But he was running now because the seconds were ticking away. As he passed Colt Master Katoom Shud, he stuck out his free hand and grabbed Butt the Hoopo's brain box from the Colt Master's hand. He ran on until he reached the cupboard containing the protective clothing for the Chupwalla divers. A minute had already passed. Haroon shoved Butt the Hoopo's brain into a pocket of his nightshirt and began to wrestle his way into the diving suit. He had placed the bite of light on a, on a con. con the bite light on a convenient railing so that he could use both hands. But how does this thing go on? He groaned in frustration as the diving suit refused to slip on smoothly. Trying to pull it over a long red nightshirt with purple patches didn't exactly help. The seconds ticked away. Although he was frantically busy with the diving suit, Haroon did notice a number of things. He noticed, for example, that Katoom Shoot had personally grabbed If the Water Genie by his blue whiskers. He also noticed that none of the Chupwallas had shadows. That could only mean one thing. Katoom Shoot had shown his most trusted devotees, the union of the unzipped lips, how to detach themselves from their shadows, just like himself. So they are all shadows here, he understood. The boat, the zip lips gang, the, and Katoom Shoot himself. Everything and everyone here is a shadow made solid, except for if, Molly, but the hoopo, and me. The third thing he noticed was this. As the brilliant light of the bite light filled the interior of the dark ship, the whole vessel seemed to quiver for a moment, to become... A little less solid, a little more shadowy, and the Chupwallas, too, trembled, and their edges softened as they began to lose their three-dimensional form. If only the sun would come out, Haroon realized, they'd all melt away. They'd become flat and shapeless, like the shadows they really are. But there was no sunlight to be found anywhere in that dim twilight, and the seconds were running out, and just as the two minutes of light came to an end, Haroon zipped up the diving suit, pulled on the goggles, and dived headfirst out of a portal towards the poisoned ocean. As he hit the water, a terrible feeling of hopelessness overcame him. What are you going to do, Haroon, he asked himself. Swim all the way back to Gup City? He fell through the waters of the ocean for a long, long time. And the deeper he went, the less filthy the story streams were and the easier it was to see. He saw the plug. Teams of Chupwalla divers were at work, bolting pieces to it. Fortunately, they were too busy to notice Haroon. The plug was about the size of a football stadium and very roughly oval. Its edges were raggedy and uneven, however, because it was being constructed to, per, to fit precisely into the wellspring, or source of stories, and the, and the two shapes, plug and wellspring, had to be a perfect match. Haroon continued to fall, and then, wonder of wonders, he caught sight of the source itself. The source of stories was a hole or chasm or crater in the seabed, and through that hole, as Haroon watched, the glowing flow of pure, unpolluted stories came bubbling up from the very heart of Kahani. There were so many streams of story, of so many different colors, all, all pouring out of the source at once that it looked like a huge underwater fountain of shining white light. In that moment, Haroon understood that if he could prevent the source from being plugged, everything would eventually be all right again. The renewed stream of, streams of story would 
would cleanse the polluted waters, and Katom Shud would fail. <clears throat> now he was at the low point of his plunge, and as he began to rise towards the surface, he thought with all his heart, oh, I wish, how I wish there was something I could do. At that moment, seemingly by chance, his hand brushed against the thigh of his diving suit, and he felt a bulge in the nightshirt pocket beneath. That's strange, he thought. I'm sure I put but the hoopo's brain box in the pocket on the other side. Then he remembered what was in that pocket, what had lain there completely forgotten ever since he first arrived in Kahani, and in a flash, he knew that there was something he could do after all. He returned to the surface with a whoosh and lifted up his goggles to take several gulps of air while taking care not to let the poisoned waters of the ocean lap his face as luck would have it. And it's high time I had some luck, Haroon thought. He had surfaced right next to the gangway to which the disabled butt the hoopo had been tethered. While the search party, which Katum Shud had sent out to recapture him, was heading off across the clearing towards the weed jungle using torches fitted with dark bulbs to help them see. <clears throat> Long beams of absolute pitch blackness raked the weed jungle. Good, thought Haroon. I hope they search in that direction for a long time. He hauled himself out of the water onto the gangway, unzipped his diving suit, and took out but the Hoopo's brain box. I'm no engineer, Hoopo, he murmured, but let's see if I can plug this back in. The Chuck Wallace had fortunately neglected to screw the lid of, of the Hoopo's head back down. Haroon climbed aboard Butt as stealthily as he could, lifted the lid, and looked inside. There were three loose leads inside the empty brain cavity. Haroon quickly found the three points on the brain box to which they had been connected. But which went where? Oh, well, he told himself, here goes nothing, and he plugged the three leads in at, in at random. But the hoopo emitted an alarming sequence of giggles and quacks and other strange noises, then burst into a weird little song. You must sing a down a down, and you call him a down a... I connected it up wrong, and I've, and, and I've set it insane, Haroon panicked aloud. He said, Hoopo, be quiet, please. Look, look, a mouse piece, piece. This piece of toasted cheese will do it, ranted but the Hoopo nonsensically. No problem. Hurriedly, Haroon disconnected the three leads and changed them around. This time, but the Hoopo began to buck and bounce like a wild horse, and Haroon jerked the leads out to prevent himself from being bucked off into the ocean. Third time lucky, I hope, he thought, and with a... <clears throat> and with a deep breath, reconnected the leads again. So what took you so long, said Butt but in his familiar voice. All fixed up now, let's go va voom Hold your horses, Hoopo, Haroon whispered. You just sit here and pretend you're still brainless. I've got something else to do. And now, at last, he reached into his other nightshirt pocket and drew out a small bottle made of many-faceted crystal with a little golden cap. The bottle was still half full of the magical golden liquid, which, if the water genie had offered him, what seemed like years earlier, wish water. The harder you wish, the better it works, if had told him. Do serious business, and the wish water will do serious business for you. This may take more than 11 minutes, Haroon whispered to Butt the Hoopo, but I'm going to do it all right. Hoopo, you just watch me try. And so saying, he unscrewed the golden lid and drank the wish water down to the last drop. All he could see was a golden light which had wrapped itself around him like a shawl. I wish, thought Haroon Khalifa, squeezing his eyes tightly shut, wishing with every fiber of his being, I wish this moon Kahani to turn so that it's no longer half in light and half in darkness. I wish it to turn this very instant in such a way that the sun shines down into the dark ship, the full hot noonday sun. That's some wish, said Buck the Hoopo's voice admiringly. This will be pretty interesting. It's your willpower against the process too complicated to explain. The minutes passed, one, two, three, four, five. Haroon lay stretched out on the back of Butt the Hoopo, oblivious of time, oblivious of everything except his wish. In the weed jungle, the Chupwalla searchers decided they were looking in the wrong place and turned back towards the dark ship. Their dark bulbed torches sent probing beams of darkness through the twilight. By chance, none of these beams fell upon Butt the Hoopo. More minutes passed, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven minutes passed. Haroon remained stretched out with his eyes shut tight, concentrating. A dark beam from the torch of a Chupwalla searcher picked him out. The hisses of the search party foamed across the waters. On their dark sea horses, they galloped towards Buck the Hoopo as fast as they could go. And then, with a mighty shuddering and a mighty juddering, Haroon Khalifa's wish came true. The moon Kahani turned quickly, because as Haroon had specified during his wishing, there was little time to be lost, and the sun rose at high speed, and zoomed up into the sky until it was directly overhead, 
where it remained. If Haroon had been in Gup City at that moment, he might have enjoyed witnessing the consternation of the eggheads at the P2C2E house, the immense supercomputers and gigantic gyroscopes that had controlled the behavior of the moon in order to preserve the eternal daylight and the perpetual darkness and the twilight strip in between and, and simply gone crazy and finally blown themselves apart. Whatever is doing this, the eggheads reported to the walrus in consternation, possesses a force beyond our power to imagine, let alone control. But Haroon was not in Gup City, whose citizens had rushed open-mouthed into the streets as night fell over Gup for the first time that anybody could remember, and the stars of the Milky Way galaxy filled the sky. No, Haroon was on the back of Buck the Hoopo, opening his eyes to find brilliant sunlight beating down on the waters of the ocean and on the dark ship. What do you know, he said. I did it. I actually managed to get it done. Never doubted you for a moment, replied Buck the Hoopo, without moving its beak. Move the whole moon by willpower? Mister, I thought. No problem. Extraordinarily, extraordinary things had begun to happen around them. The Chippewa searchers racing towards Haroon on their dark seahorses began to shriek and hiss at the sunlight. And then both Chippewas and horses grew fuzzy at the edges and began, as it seemed, to melt into the poisoned, lethally acid ocean they sank, turning into the ordinary shadows, then sizzling away altogether. Look, yelled Haroon, look what's happening to the ship. The sunlight had undone the black magic of the cult master Khatoum Shud. Shadows could not remain solid in that brightness, and the huge ship itself had started to melt and started losing its shape as if it were a mountain of ice cream left out in the sun by mistake. If Molly, shouted Haroon, and in spite of Butt's warnings, he rushed up the gangway, which was becoming softer by the minute, towards the heavy deck, towards the heaving deck. By the time he reached the deck, it was so sticky soft that Haroon felt he was walking through fresh tar or perhaps glue. Chipwalla soldiers were screeching and rushing about madly, dissolving before Haroon's eyes into pools of shadow and then vanishing altogether because once the sorcery of Katoom Shoot had been destroyed by the sunlight, no shadow could survive without someone or something to be attached to, to be the shadow of. The cult master, or to be precise, his shadow self, was nowhere to be seen. Poison was evaporating from the cauldrons on deck. The cauldrons themselves were growing flabby and melting like dark butter. Even the gigantic crane to which the plug was attached by huge chains was tilting and lolling in the, sh in the shocking light of day. The water genie and the floating gardener had been suspended over two of the poison cauldrons by ropes, which had been looped around their middles and then fastened to the smaller cranes that stood by each of the poison tanks. Just as Haroon spotted them, the ropes broke. And they were wo as they were woven out of shadows too. And if and Molly plunged out of this out of sight into the evil cauldrons, Haroon gave an anguished cry. But the poison in the cauldrons had been boiled dry by the sun, and the cauldrons themselves had grown so soft that as Haroon watched, if and Molly pulled away great sections with their bare hands, creating holes huge enough for them to step through. The cauldrons had been reduced to the consistency of melting cheese, and so had the deck itself. Let's get out of here, Haroon suggested. The others followed him down the melting, rubbery gangway. If and Haroon leapt aboard but the Hoopo and Molly stepped on the water beside them. Mission accomplished, cried Haroon joyfully. Hoopo, full speed ahead. Varoom, agreed but the Hoopo, without moving its beak. It began moving rapidly away from the dark ship toward the channel which Molly had cut in the weed jungle. And then there was an unhealthy sounding noise and the slight smell of burning from Hoopo's brain cavity and they came to a halt. He's blown a fuse, if pointed out. Haroon was mortified. I guess I didn't make the right connections after all, he said. And I thought I'd been so good. Now he's ruined. He'll never work again. The great thing about a mechanical brain, if consoled him, is that it can be fixed up, overhauled, even replaced. There's always a spare at the service station in Gup City. If we could get the hoopo back there, it would be as right as rain, hunky-dory, first class. If we could get any of us back to anywhere, Haroon said... They were adrift in the old zone with no prospect of help after everything they had been through, Haroon thought. It just didn't seem fair. I'll push for a while, Molly offered, and he had just begun to do so when a strange, sad, sucking sound, the dark ship of Cultmaster Khatoum Shud, finally melted right away. And the plug, incomplete as it was, fell harmlessly onto the ocean bed, leaving the source of stories entirely un unblocked up. Fresh stories would go on pouring out of it, and so one day the ocean would be clean again, and all the stories, even the oldest ones, would taste as good as new. Molly could push them no further. 
He fell across the hoopoe's back, exhausted. It was mid-afternoon now. The moon Kahani had settled down to a normal speed of rotation, and they drifted across the southern pol polar ocean, not knowing what to do next. Just then, there was a bubbling and a frothing in the water beside them, and Haroon recognized with immense relief the many smiling mouths of the plenty maw fishes. Goopy, baga! He greeted them happily, and they replied, Have no worries, have no fear, we'll get you out of here. You've done enough, throw down the reins. We'll soon have you safe again. So Baga and Goopy, taking the reins of Butt the Hoopo in their mouths, towed the companions out of the old zone. I wonder what be what became of Katoom Shoot, Haroon finally said. If gave, gave a contented shrug. Done for, I can vouch for that, he said. No escape for the cult master. He melted away like the rest of them. It's curtains for him. He's history. Good night, Charlie. I.e., he's Katoom Shoot. This was only the shadow self, remember, Haroon pointed out soberly. The other cult master, the real one, is probably battling it out right now with General Khatib and the pages and Mudra and my father and Blabbermouth. Blabbermouth, he thought privately. I wonder if she missed me just a little bit. What had been the twilight strip was now bathed in the light of the sun. From now on, Kahani will be a sensible moon, Haroon thought, with sensible days and nights. In the distance, to the northeast, he saw lit up by the evening sun for the first time in many an, age, many an age, the coastline of the land of Chuck. Well, 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 Mr. Rushdie, you're funny. You really are. 